Thank you. Good afternoon, Committee of the Institute of Certified Management Accountants of Sri Lanka, the national, the national professional management accounting body in Sri Lanka, incorporated by an act of parliament. CMA has always played a lead role in this digital environment to upgrade the knowledge of its members by opening continuing professional development CPD program for its members and students. The presentation on the new tax changes and impact on professionals and employees will be conducted by a panel of experts in taxation. The presentation will be delivered by Mr. Ensulaima, partner, tax, Ernest and Young. This will be followed by a brief presentation and a question and answer session with Mr. N.R. Gajendran, senior partner, Gajman Company, Mr. A. Ravira, managing partner, Ranavira Associates, Mr. S. Pereira, principal tax and regulator at KPMG, Mr. K. Sivanesan, tax consultant, senior partner at Amrasagar and Company, Professor A. Fernando of University of Sri Jayatanapura, and senior professor B. Marambe of the University of Pradenia. Mr. Sulaiman will function as the moderator as well. I also warmly welcome CMA President Professor Lakshman R. Bhattavala and other council members, members of CMA, invitees, ladies and gentlemen. To commence the program, I have pleasure in inviting Professor Lakshman R. Bhattavala, founder president of CMA Sri Lanka, to deliver the welcome address and the introduction to today's topic. Professor Lakshmanar Bhattavala has led the Sri Lankan accounting professional having been the president of the Chartered Accountants, President South Asian Federation of Accountants and founder signatory to the formation of SAFA, founder of WAT Sri Lanka and founder of CMA Sri Lanka. He is currently a SAFA board member and chairman of the SAFA International Relay. Professor Lakshman R. Vatapuna to invite you to do the weather welcome address. Thank you, Mr. Gajendra, the chairman of the taxation committee of uh, CMA Sri Lanka. Uh, our uh, presenter, panelists, the uh, members, invitees, and also our all those who are attending our CMA tax webinar. Today, it's a very uh, important uh, topic that we have got on the new tax changes and impact on professionals and employees. Uh, we have found that uh, at all our tax webinars, uh, the attendance has been very much more than any of the others. Today, we have uh, over 800 registrants. I'm sure uh, a lot of them are still joining and that uh, they would... Uh, attend the webinar because there is a lot of interest. Because you can see that the recent tax changes which were implemented from 1st January 23 have affected many of the professionals and employees directly because you find that uh, since they are employed at their place of uh, employment, these taxes are being deducted. So, at the end of the day, when they get their uh, tax, uh, uh, maybe the uh, slips and also their, or their pay slips, they find that a large chunk has been deducted from their salary. So this, this is really rather uh, unfortunate, but uh, this is due to the uh, very, uh, maybe uh, the the tax policy that is, is, existed earlier was a very liberal and maybe very friendly with the employees and the professionals. But however, uh, the government have felt that uh, they are not getting their due share and uh, they have started uh, taxing the professionals and employees. So today we have a very uh, expert uh, uh, presenter and also expert panel uh, who will be able to uh, uh, to do justice to this topic because they will be able to tell about the tax, not only the, the tax charging of the tax, but also its implications. And I'm also happy that we have uh, uh, two uh, uh, professors from the universities who will also be there uh, to tell us the impact on the uh, 
uh, professionals and also the university members uh, who are really uh, also having a, a tough time. So if you look at uh, all these areas, now uh, uh, CMA Sri Lanka, we have been conducting a number of webinars, not only on the tax area, but also on the economy, on the costing, on the pricing. So these have been uh, very many uh, areas that are currently having a very serious impact. The last one was on the economy, where the, the director research of the central bank was there and explained about the economy. And according to him, uh, things were uh, very bad, but now things are improving. So uh, one of the most important things is that uh, they now have to restructure the debt. No one knew or no one expected that we will be in today's position. Not, to, not even those in the private sector, not on those in the public sector, not to, not even those in the political political sector knew as to whether we are going to be in such a very serious bad situation. But today we have fallen into that situation. We are now a broke nation who has to uh, maybe restructure ourselves to make a new beginning. Uh, of course, this is uh, not new in many countries. This has happened even countries like Japan. They, they were in very serious problems after the last uh, world war and then they came back. So I think we also have to look at this, but this means real hard work. Hard work and also maybe we need to take into account a lot of the uh, hardships. Some of the people who can afford may, be, may have to also really pay a bigger contribution than the others. Now, if you look at the... Uh, current situation. Now, first of all, there was, of course, we are going, uh, our economy badly affected. Then we have the debt. If you take a loan, you know the impact it will have. The debt is very, very high. The foreign debt, the local debt, and this has had serious uh, repercussions. With the depreciation of the rupee, all the things jumped up in price. So this is also another uh, real concern. And that's why the cost and management accounting profession has to play a very major role. The financial accounting profession because financial management has to be there cost discipline has to be there they say there should be cost reflective pricing mechanisms so there are various uh, things that have discussed but if the professionals are not there to carry these out then we are going to be in a problem so that's why now if you see one by one uh, things uh, seem to be uh, done in order that we can be in a position where we be able to restructure our debt or to meet uh, our uh, situation to favor the uh, International Monetary Fund to make us a debt. Now it is debt unsustainable, but a debt sustainable country which can carry on its activities and repay the debts. So we have had the full increase. Then uh, we have had uh, the, uh, yesterday's one, the increase in the electricity. <laughs> Now you can find that the price of the electricity, the increase in the fuel. So everything is being adjusted. Now what they call is the cost reflective pricing mechanism. But this is where the professionals are required because when you say cost reflective pricing, this not, should not include the wastage, the, the corruption, the inefficiency, and various other uh, overheads that are added on. So that's why we feel that Although the cost reflective pricing mechanism has been taken place in the electricity board, within six months, they will have to adjust and give the best cost. They'll have to be the least cost, removing all these wastages, the uh, inefficiencies, and then take us on to a productive mode. That will be the real least cost. So I think that's uh, something that we have to do, and we have to really make a claim on that side. So the all these things have been done uh, in order to maybe to make uh, ourselves to be uh, accepted by the foreign uh, international monetary fund to provide us the funding because there are two or three important things in this not that we would, we would like to be in this situation but we have to get out of the situation because if they are uh, they come in they give the credibility they give the credibility to, to all the nations that Sri Lanka is a safe country. Tourism will increase. 
our exports will increase, foreign investment will come in. So that is how it has to be worked out. Because we have to now speak also from a professional view. I know that a lot of hardships are there, but still we have to see how we can really bring this uh, country to a situation that uh, where the professionals will lead this situation. So that's why we feel that it is a very, very uh, important thing that we make everyone aware of what is happening, that the problems that they are there, because you see, if all the learned people leave this country, then we are going to have a problem. If the high taxation is there, you tax them, then they go off. But then they, how, how can we retain them? Now, these are matters that will be discussed today. So I'm sure I must thank everyone because they are coming here, they are uh, making available their uh, time to us. And of course, we have made this available uh, free of charge to everyone because of these learned professors uh, and the other uh, panelists uh, and the uh, very learned people in the professional accounting field uh, who are here with us to give their knowledge to you. So you must be thankful to them because they are here to tell you what is there and also to show you what is the correct path we take. So I am very thankful to all of them and I'm sure that this uh, 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 webinar that has had, I think the largest registration that we have had in the recent past, because I know January was not a very good month. So they want to see how, how best we can do in order to overcome this or whether we need to go in this way and gradually where we are able to get the benefits to come in. So uh, let me again hand you over to our, uh, uh, our uh, yeah, compere Mr. Gajendran, the chairman of the Relaxation Committee, so that he could continue uh, with the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Next on agenda is the presentation on the new changes and impact on professional and employees by Mr. N. Sulaiman, partner tax at Ernest & Young. Over to you, Mr. Sulaiman. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gajendra. And thank you, uh, Professor and CMA, for inviting me. Uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, Can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine, fine. Okay, fine. Yeah, make it bigger. Right. You can see the cover page, right, Mr. Gajajan? Yeah, fine. We can see. Right. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, session on the new taxes or new tax changes impacting both professionals uh, and employees. So this will take a, a view of the impacts mainly to individuals uh, on uh, their professional income and uh, employment income. So we'll be covering personal taxes, how it applies to an individual generally, uh, then to employees and professionals more specifically, uh, how withholding tax will probably impact uh, both these um, categories um, and the impacts on certain investment income that individuals may have. Right? Uh, so personal income tax, I think we are aware of the rules, but so many things have changed. Uh, let's just reestablish where we stand. So as an individual or a person, uh, meaning an in, uh, individual, whether you're employed or whether you're a professional, uh, the maximum rate from uh, January 1st, 2023 has drastically increased from 18% uh, to 36% is the maximum now, right? I think everyone was aware of that. Uh, and the slabs have reduced from a 3 million slab to a 500,000 slab. Um, there was this concession rate given only to the supply of electricity and gems and jewelry if you were an individual in that, that area of business or profession. So that 14% also has been removed and capital gains tax uh, on individuals remains at uh, 10%. There is no change. So these are the basic rates for individuals. On the um, uh, personal tax relief, <laughs> it has been reduced from 3 million per annum, 200,000 per month to 1.2 million per annum or 100,000 per month. The expenditure relief of 1.2 million 
given for medical education, uh, housing loans have also been removed. Uh, however, uh, if you have invested in solar panels, <laughs> the expenditure deduction on uh, fixing solar panels of 600,000 per annum, that will still continue provided the expenditure has already been incurred, right? The carry forward will be uh, allowed. So, uh, how it looks is, so this year, the year of assessment 22-23, the running year that will end this March, is an odd year or it's a year in transition because these changes came midway, right? Generally, changes to income tax come at the end of the year, the start of a new year of assessment, it, it applies. However, due to the current situation, as mentioned by uh, Professor Watavala, they were forced to bring these uh, changes with immediate effect, and hence it has come in between or within uh, a year of assessment. So this is a transition year of assessment, and hence, based on the recent amendment, has two periods within the year of assessment itself. Right? So the first period for individuals, that is professionals and employees, it will be 1st April to December 31st, 2022. And that will have the table on your left-hand side, which is the prorated, so 3 million, it was 3 million a step earlier. This has been prorated for nine months, right? So 2.25 million will be tax-free. Uh, the next slab at 6%, next slab at 12 and 80. So that is for the first nine months, you will have to calculate your annual total income in the first nine months based on this uh, old law. And then on the right hand side, you have the period from January 1st, 2023 to March. That's a three months period. And that will have the new slabs, which starts at 1.2 million. So 1.2 million tax free allowance here has been prorated for three months. So that's how you get 300,000. And the 500,000 tax slabs have also been prorated for three months. So it's a slab of 125,000 for uh, each slab at 6, 12, 18, 24, and 36. Right? So these are the slabs that will apply to individuals <coughs> going forward. Then the next year, 23-24, year of assessment 23-24, uh, we have the full year in the new slabs uh, with the 1.2 million being nil. Uh, or no uh, tax for the first 1.2 million and then subsequently for every 500,000 slab of income, you will have uh, a 6% incremental uh, rate applying all the way up to a highest of 36%. So what is the impact to employment? Let's take the employee. So that what we just discussed was generally applicable to individuals. And now we move, we move into employment. Right. Employment, as you know, there are no deductions from employment. You will pay on your gross salary. And what differs is that the pay as you earn scheme that was <coughs> uh, replaced by the advanced personal income tax uh, from January 1st, 2022 was only optional, right? Up to 31st December, it was optional. So employees were able to opt for or against an employer deducting APIT. However, from January 1st, that has been now made mandatory. So that is a significant change where the tax is now collected at source. So APIT is now mandatory for all taxpayers from January 1st, 2023. That's a significant change coming into effect. All of us would have seen that uh, with the January salaries coming through. So for employees, uh, the monthly impact of this uh, the monthly impact of those new slabs is that the 100,000 will be tax free. And then for every 41,667, every additional slab of 41,667 per month, you will have these rates applied. Right? So anything over uh, a total of the last line, if you look at, is anything over 308,333. Right? Uh, anything over that will be now liable at 36%. So anything over basically three. 3 lakhs, uh, 8,000 will be at 36%. Um, anything between 183 to 2025, the top will be, highest will be 18%. So you reach the maximum very fast uh, under the new slabs. So that is why um, it needs to be looked at uh, carefully and the impact uh, considered on both employer and employee. So this is a Another sort of comparison uh, uh, of how it will affect your monthly salary. Uh, so the first two columns, uh, the first column is the salaries. The second column 
is the rate of maximum rate of tax that will apply to you if your salary is let's say three lakhs then we have the current law impact and the additional amount so the first if anyone getting hundred thousand both the laws there was no tax two hundred thousand the old law there was no tax the new law now there is a ten thousand five hundred coming so it results in a ten thousand five hundred increase if we jump to four hundred thousand a month earlier we were taxed only nine thousand now it's seventy thousand and that's going up by sixty one thousand an additional hit if you are earning 750,000, earlier maximum rate was only 12% at 445,000 is all you paid per month. Now it's going up drastically to 196,500, uh, an additional of one and a half lakhs over. And anyone earning 1 million uh, paid 90,000 earlier, now it's 286,000, an increment of one. Lakh. So the impact of this is quite significant as you uh, progress uh, higher and higher on your monthly income right so that is on the cash right so this applies to your total income uh, and the slabs then apply to uh, these income slabs so how do you compute this income for employment you have two categories the first category is the cash benefit that means an employer pays you cash you take that as the whole whatever they pay you in cash whatever it's called whatever allowance is called it is uh, aggregated and to that you have to now add the non-cash benefits right so non-cash benefits there was some confusion initially then there was something issued in december that was now changed uh recently uh again so um, giving a lot of uncertainty to the market as to what really applies so i'll take you through what the latest circular i'm not sure if it's going to change again uh, so this is the, the latest circular gives in terms of non-cash benefits. So non-cash benefits, generally any non-cash benefit should take a market value unless the commission in general stipulates a deemed value. And this is what this circular does. It gives a deemed value for various benefits given to employees. Right? The first is residence. If you provide a place of residence <laughs> to your employee, meaning the company either owns or leases it out on your behalf is the understanding then the value of that benefit is deemed to be, if it's a rated area, that means in a sort of a city area where it's rated, it's 12.5% of the monthly salary. Right? If it's unrated, like in an estate or something like that, it's 10% of the monthly salary. Now, earlier, this had a cap. Uh, and if it was furnished, there was an additional 5,000 added. So those have been removed. Uh, that is a disadvantage to those earning a high salary, right? Because the undertaking when they put a cap it doesn't your salary doesn't matter but this is more catered towards those who are having a lower salary low cash salary are benefited as a result of not as if you are reducing the cap so because only a percentage of their salary now gets added as the uh, non-cash benefit for uh, residents right so the current status is you have if it's a rated area you have to uh, at 12 and a half percent of the salary to uh, the cash benefit and then compute what rate will apply. In the case of provision of vehicle, that also has been changed. Earlier it was based on the market, uh, so the engine capacity of the vehicle. Now that has been removed completely. And if a vehicle is provided by the employer, then for the vehicle, a 20,000 non-cash benefit is added. If a driver is also provided, an additional 10,000 is added. And if fuel is also provided, there is an additional 20,000 added. So that's a total. If you provide all three of these, it's a benefit of 50,000. So how this works is that you have to, it starts with the circular starts with that a vehicle has to be provided by the employer first. Right. So whether these can be taken independently is a question uh, looks unlikely to me because the starting point of this is that a vehicle should first be provided and with that vehicle fuel and so if a vehicle is not provided, for example, and the employer only provides fuel or employs a driver, can you take this 10,000 or 20,000 is a question at the moment, the way it is drafted. Right. So continuing with motor vehicle benefit. There is additionally, if you provide a motorbike to the employer, 
with fuel uh, there is an amount of only 5000 that is so this is significantly a big saving to the employee right because even if you take this uh, motor vehicle if let's say you get a car that the rental value is let's say 500000 rupees a month or 300000 rupees a month and fuel you pump uh, let's say uh, 200 liters a month Uh, but is added to the employees only fifty thousand in this case, right? So significant advantage to the employee if it can be structured, right? So similarly with the middle level and lower level employees as well, this motorbike facility also will be a huge advantage. Where only five thousand rupees is added if a motorbike with fuel is provided to them. So this is the value of the the private use, right? So for official use, obviously it's not a benefit, but for the private use, they are valuing it at only five thousand. In the case of motorbikes, the second para here, hmm. uh, it will be only three thousand if fuel is not provided by the employer, right? Then in the case of field work, so we have a lot of people going on marketing, uh, a lot of people going on to factory on factory visits or in the estates. Uh, so if a vehicle is given for field work, and the um, there's a maintenance of the usage because of how many kilometers. Uh, for each there is a log that is maintained then uh, only 25000 25 sorry 25 rupees irrespective of the um, engine capacity is considered as a benefit right so if you do 1000 kilometers in a month uh, it will be 25000 is what will be added uh, so and that also they have capped at 20000 even if you go above this the maximum that you add to the employee salary when a vehicle for field work is provided <laughs> only twenty thousand is uh, added. In the case of a motorbike, uh, it's only five rupees uh, per kilometer. So these are things that can drastically reduce. I think bring a lot of employees down in terms of their slabs if it is uh, structured and it will be structured in a way that it reflects the substance of what is actually being uh, given. Uh, yeah. So none of this. Can actually be reimbursed, unfortunately, right? So you can't tell the employee, okay, you do it, I'll pay you. That has been that right has been or that concession has not specifically disallowed in this last one, uh, where it says that any of these expenses which are reimbursed in cash. So if the employee is getting cash, uh, then you don't get the non-cash benefit advantage. You will have to tax it as a cash benefit. So that is where uh, you will have to look at it carefully if you are trying to deploy. Uh, a system of providing the non-cash benefit for vehicle as well as for um, residents, right? So, what this new circular brought was those two caps were removed, plus this very interesting concession given only to government servants, right? Which is uh, rather um, unfair, I would think, by not the private sector. Private sector is also contributing. uh similarly or even more to the economy uh, why is this only given to the government sector is a question so the benefit given is that in the absence of as so the benefit is given for three types if the government provides a vehicle fuel or communication facilities right and if the government is not able to give a vehicle they have the practice of it appears they have the practice of providing an allowance right for vehicle and fuel and if that allowance is Under circular directive, once is considered to be a benefit, not the hundred. So if you get one lakh for your car, only twenty-five thousand is added to the salary. Whereas in the private sector, if you give hundred thousand for a car, the whole hundred thousand is taxed. So that's where uh, they could have easily given to the private sector as well. Um, so this type of uh, Sort of discriminatory treatment, I think, only affects uh, confidence. Only affects the confidence of all parties concerned. So my recommendation: this should be re-looked at, and a equitable sort of suggestion uh, should come through. Right. So the other significant change is this loans, which is another interesting uh, non-cash benefit. So if the employer provides a loan uh, at concession rates or any rate, it will not be. Taxed in the hands of the employee, so there is no benefit uh, on the interest-free loan or a low level, uh, low interest rate loan given by the employee. Earlier it was nine percent that has been removed and now made zero percent. So nothing will be added to the employee's salary 
a concession and road is given. So in addition to that, we have all of these benefits that are taxed at 100%. So provision of hotel facility for expatriates, totally tax, provision of servants, provision of electricity and gas, provision of medical benefits, free meals, 100% of the cost, payment of dental, medical and healthcare if it's not a uniform scheme, uh, payment of telephone bills, air tickets, and payment of tax. So even if you reimburse the tax, that is also tax 100%. So these are the uh, non-cash benefits that have come in the, the recent circular, right? So in addition to that, so all of these rates and all of it apply to professionals as well. And in the case of professionals, of course, you have, if you're in uh, as, a, as a sole proprietorship or a partnership, uh, you will have the benefit of deducting expenses, unlike employees, uh, on the service fee that you get. Uh, and... There's a bit of a disturbance, Professor. Uh, I think you're not on mute. Okay. Um, so on professionals, you get the profit. Uh, and then it is on the profit that those slabs will apply. So when you arrive at the profit, you have the normal impacts that is allowable, disallowable, that analysis will have to be taken place. And on the net amount, you will uh, pay the uh, slabs. However, there is... Uh, an advantage to the professionals that have been given or that can be looked at as an option is where this nine months, three months also comes in and they have given you the opportunity to prorate, meaning you can go on actual. So you can do a nine months working of your actual profit uh, based on revenue, revenues you earn for each month for the first nine months, back off the expenses and you come at a profit. Uh, and the next three months, you can take the same profit and then you'll use the two slabs that I showed you for the first three, uh, nine months and first three months. Alternatively, if you're not able to split it that way and you're having annual accounts, you can do a full computation of So uh, they have given you both because the law clearly says you may use this option as well. Uh, I believe you can take advantage uh, of it uh, in the absence of the ability to have separate uh, accounts. But for all other sources, you don't have this prorating. You have to go on actual. So if it's employment and investment, you can't take this 75-25 prorate. You have to go on the actual investment income earned or employment income earned in the first nine months and actual for the second three months and apply the slabs appropriate. So another thing that will apply to professionals is the withholding tax, right? Uh, depending on what you're doing. Um, uh, the key in uh, withholding that you will be exposed to not only from your profession, but from your investments as well. You have 5% uh, on your interest, that means on all your deposits. So this will apply to employees as well. Um, on rent, if you have some investment in a property and you're getting rental income, there will be a 10% withholding now. And if you have invested in shares, there will be a 15%, although it will be a final tax. The other two are not final. Print and interest is not final. Uh, dividend is final. Uh, so on service fees, so what will affect professionals uh, will be this withholding tax on service fees. Again, only if it exceeds 100,000, aggregate exceeds 100,000 per month, is a 5% withholding to individuals practicing uh, doctors, engineers, accountants, lawyers, software developers, researchers, and academics. Okay, so far they have only uh, restricted it to these um, professionals. Uh, any other, they have said they will uh, sort of guess at it. The latest um, circular also says that nobody else gets captured into this. And if anyone does that, they will guess at it. So, what will come into that, we really don't know at the moment. Uh, so this will affect uh, professionals upfront because when they they will get only 95% of their revenue into their hands. So it's uh, very important to ensure you get a withholding tax certificate for the five so that it can be claimed against your final tax liability. So uh, certain investments that you may have as, as individuals, uh, there are still some exemptions in place. Uh, for example, uh, gains on sale of listed shares is exempt. 
gains in the realization of shares of a non-resident company if you have foreign company shares and you own more than 10 percent of the exam uh, also uh, gains on foreign shares which are remitted to sri lanka through a bank and the capital gains tax gains of the realization of shares in sri lanka uh, will be taxed only at 10 percent that has not been increased so those concessions are still available uh, dividend income uh, there is an exemption on foreign dividends where you have more than 10% uh, ownership in that company. Um, dividends from hub uh, services, company that's doing hub services continues to be exempt. And then uh, dividends from a non-resident company, if it is remitted to Sri Lanka, uh, also continue to be exempt. Interest on the other hand, uh, FCBU accounts and special deposit accounts continue to be exempt, the interest on those. Um, and interest income non-resident uh, on loans granted to a person in Sri Lanka or government in Sri Lanka. So that's the individual outside non-resident gets it. Uh, where it is not exempt, the 5% withholding tax will uh, apply on interest. In the case of property, uh, still the gains from your principal place of residence, if you own it for three years and live in it for two years, is exempt. The gain that you, uh, when you, if you sell your principal place of residence. Um, but any other property that is doesn't fall within that exemption will have the 10% capital gains coming in. Rent income, uh, the withholding of 10% uh, on the full amount, if it exceeds 100,000 per month, so your rent is likely to decrease uh, by 10% um, uh, in the case of residence. So this is not a final tax, but you have to make sure you get the withholding tax certificate to ensure you can claim it in your final calculator. So those are the uh, key changes uh, that have taken place in terms of global rates. Um, we just done this chart, um, the Europe and America and Asia Pacific, Sri Lanka going from 18% to 36%, an 18% increase. Uh, one of the few countries that has such a significant increase, but of course we were very low for quite some time. So I suppose it's a, we are playing catch up too. Uh, China at 45 maximum. Uh, on the other side, you have USA at 37. So uh, individual taxes high overall, the region and the globe. Uh, capital gains, of course, um, also we are a little on the high side with 30, this is for the companies, but for individuals, uh, 10 is, I think, quite a concessionary rate uh, compared to some other jurisdictions. So uh, that's the presentation uh, on these recent changes. Uh, I'd like to hand over to uh, Mr. Gajendran uh, to take it forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Suleiman. Next on agenda is the panel discussion and question and answer session, which will be moderated by Mr. N. Sulaima. Joining us as panelists are Mr. N. R. Gajendran, Mr. S. Pereira, Mr. K. Sivanesan, Mr. A. Ranavira, Professor A. Fernando, and Senior Professor B. Parambe. We invite you to send your question and answer using the Q&A options. Over to you, Mr. Sulaima. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, so. Uh, to start off with, I'd like to first thank and welcome all the uh, panelists on board. Um, uh, on the changes, uh, your views, any comments you want to give, uh, if we can go uh, one by one. Um, uh, Professor, there is no order that you have put forward, is there? Uh, no order. I think we'll start okay. with Mr. Gajendran and then do it. Right, sure. So, Mr. Gajendra, if you can just give your initial thoughts and views on these changes, please. Yeah, thanks, Sulaiman. Uh, uh, basically, it was ben Benjamin Franklin who said, nothing is certain other than debt and taxes. Mm -hmm. Now, the, see that the way the protests are being held now, there seems to be... Uh, even the certainty on income tax matters because uh, it's, it's affecting all the people virtually uh, anyone and everyone if you see the even the low income strata of people technically even if you're a three-wheeler 
you are going to be paying, you, you will earn 100,000 or more under the current uh, pricing system. Otherwise, he will not be able to survive. Now, the if when uh, when a lot of individuals, particularly employees, are discussing uh, with the uh, professionals, uh, you know, they are saying so many things in different perspective. I will share some of them. Uh, it is through the intensity of the problem and how are we going to resolve this problem? Uh, so one person said, uh, uh, even for the our own parents, we are not in a position to spend one third of our salary. Even to our own parents, we can't spend one third of our salary because it's unaffordable. To the uh, to the government, right? Uh, that is because taxes have become unbearable. Now, if uh, you know taxes uh, may be a necessary evil, but if it is unbearable, it will lose its legitimacy. That's what has happened. And uh, when it loses legitimacy, it also makes the government also illegitimate, or they makes the government feel you, you have no uh, mandate at the moment. So. Uh, basically, uh, if uh, uh, sorry, the you know, uh, and when that happens, it can destroy the government. Uh, destroy when you say government can destroy the country. Uh, so most of the other people are asking, what's next? Many of them are asking, what's next? Now, okay, we are doing this uh, one month from now, three months from now. What's going to happen? You know, there is, a, there is also a fear psychosis because uh, there are people who draw as much as uh, 800,000 rupees, 1 million rupees of income, not only the lower strata, the people who are on the higher income situations, they have already committed uh, loans for various purposes, maybe for vehicles, maybe for uh, housing, and, uh, uh, and the interest rates, also being adjusted because the rates have gone up. Uh, some of them say 25, 30, 50,000, they have to pay more in interest. So, and one person gave about 800,000 rupees. When he got the money into the take home pay, he ended up with only about 35,000 rupees. Even in some of the government institutions uh, uh, where people are having negative take home pay, you know, in certain institutions, you can. Uh, uh, you can uh, borrow or do certain things uh, up to 70% of your salary, even government institutions. So when they get this new increased taxes, it is, um, uh, it's, 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 it's being a, a negative home. So it's a, you are disrupting the whole, the individual's life. You know, there is a fear whether you can lead your lives. Now, if the government on the other hand is saying, the government expenditure cannot be rescheduled uh, for the next two years. They are, I mean, they are saying, and if you see some of the expenditures have increased and our uh, deficit is about 2.4 trillion rupees, which, which is monumental. Now, if you if the government can't manage the expenditure we could need, then how do the individuals do? Now, what is the uh, option we have? If you see, you heard some of the alternate uh, government people, they are saying, uh, recently it was mentioned uh, that uh, in other countries, there are 40%, 45%, 50% taxes. Uh, so there can be a, the, the, you give relief to the smaller strata and you're going to tax uh, the highest, higher, higher income. Now, you have to realize that in those countries, the facilities are different. The infrastructure is different. You can rely on public. So now if uh, that answer also may not be palatable because of that there is brain drain. Talent retention is becoming a problem. So uh, some of the people, when they talk to them individuals face to face, you see an anger on their face. You know, so how? Uh, what is the other solution? The solution is simple. There must be a determined effort to curb expenditure. You have to curb the expenditure. You can't wait for one year, two years. Immediately, you have to curb the expenditure. If you see even uh, the uh, defense expenditure of 23, it has grown up, going, it is going up by about 30 or 40%. So these are expenditures you have to look at it. 
and basically you have to make sure uh, corruption malpractice is not there then of course people will uh, people will not will bear some burden now they say what they don't see uh, what good the tax is being doing they have, if they pay tax what are they doing the parliamentarians uh, people in uh, high positions are unaffected by this the way they the the profligacy and the affluence that they demonstrate so basically it's a total disruption of uh, for the individuals and families so it's an if it it's i think a statement has been made uh, even if there is uh, extreme uh, resistance this uh, tax policy will go through so basically we have a lot of unanswered questions uh, uh, for the people and there is a huge fear psychosis what can they do some of the people don't have money how are they going to uh, when the take home pain is deficit what are they going to do they have to default uh, some loans or default payment of the tax or uh, you have to uh, forego some uh, essential prerequisites for which will be essential to enjoy a minimum quality of life so it's uh, it's all doom and gloom for uh, individuals as it is at the highest level of 36% because over 300000 rupees you are increasing your your taxes are uh, at 36 percent and more than that at the low strata when the incremental taxes is almost starting with 11 12 percent and then it's coming down uh, to about two uh, percent one other thing is you know there is a feeling that you must tax these uh, people who are earning high income that is okay but don't forget the people who are earning high income they are not got it just like that if it is professionals they have sacrificed they have toiled for it and they have earned it hard and sweat even businessmen they are taking in the difficult situations they have operated in the country and they are uh, basically uh, taking risks greater risk to reward uh, so it the if it is income tax, it should be on the principle of capacity to pay for sure. But don't forget the principle of capacity has been diminished uh, and eroded because the drop in value of the rupee, because our foreign uh, currency crashed by about 100%. And also there is demand and supply mismatch, uh, which has also pushed up the prices. So basically, those are my initial thoughts, Suleiman. Um, uh, you can proceed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gajendran. Uh, can I have uh, Professor Anil Jairatna next on your comments and what you think of these changes? Professor Anil, Anil Fanad. Anil. Yes, sorry. Okay. Anil Fanad, sorry. So first of all, let, let me thank um, UCMA uh, for organizing this and bringing uh, these uh, timely needed uh, uh, public discourses on uh, recent changes in taxation. Um, actually, these changes can be discussed um, from different perspectives. Um, the mainly, uh, I think uh, as professionals, so we have to first understand uh, its connectivity to the economy. So though we claim, of course, um, a tax goes to the government revenue, but it's not a revenue. It's uh, merely a shifting of income from one place to the other. It's pretty much connected to the economy. So that that, that could be the reason why, like uh, when we develop our fiscal policies and all those things, we need to we abide by certain principles, this fairness, economic growth, stability, uh, and all those things. So, like, unless you pay attention on the other side, economy, so how best the value is created, how best the economy is revived, and if you just simply just argue and analyze and talk about the efficacy and all those of the taxation, only from one perspective, that is to fill the coffer of the government uh, to have the revenue, of course, that would create um, uh, lots of problems. So that, um, of course, we, we can discuss it's more uh, what I proposed in the first place uh, to take into account the context in which uh, the taxation has been imposed, 
how it's going to be collected and how uh, that, that's going to impact on the individual's lives, economy, future, everything. So finally, it's the human, uh, um, the life. Uh, whereby, so three contexts, social, political, cultural, and all those things are important. Um, so coming back to the uh, uh, question, like uh, how best we could um, um, uphold the, the fairness. So th that is one of the biggest issues as other speakers also just highlighted. So if it's not going to be fair, of course, lots of resistance would come. There is no cooperation because society is a place. So the, the quality of the society depends on how, uh, like um, how much we uh, cooperate and uh, for common uh, purposes. So if it's not going to be fair, lots of rifts and uh, uh, issues may be created for sure. Um, in terms of fairness uh, from the government uh, the side, of course, they have brought up a kind of a threshold. Of course, everyone is liable to tax. We have to accept that fact. We have to pay in addition to our indirect taxes, uh, direct uh, uh, taxes, everyone is supposed to pay tax. But the taxation should be imposed normally from practical point of view, on the excess income that you get to have a kind of financial freedom, to have your life, to have enough food and shelter, health, education, that at least. So if you can't get that and you have to pay more taxes, of course, that would lead to lots of issues. For example, with the current statistics and the data available, uh, to some extent, 100,000 is going to be somewhere closer to a uh, um, the poor level of a family, which consists of 4. Point, normally average family size in Sri Lanka is 4.17. Uh, so now we tax. Then what what would happen? Even with that context, context we can uh, like argue and say, of course, that is pretty obvious. That is not fair. Uh, if that threshold can be uh, increased, uh, th th that would be a kind of uh, really. Even if it is going to be fair like this tax collection system, the efficiency and the um, inland revenue, uh, I mean, tax nets, tax audits should be should be operating in such a manner that people can accept. So it is a fact that I just collected some information about this remise as well. So we have paid lots of money for remise, but remise is not working, mainly due to not making a payment of just two rupees, uh, two billion rupees. So because of that reason, still the system has not been updated from 2018-19. Then the information tax return information is manually feeded. And uh, it has not been integrated with the other income sources. Like So one of the major ideas of uh, RAMIS, implementation of RAMIS is to bring the tax net into one integrated network. So then only we can talk about the, the fairness and other aspects. So that is another problem in the uh, Ramis system in terms of efficiency and the, transfer, the transparency. And further, if you just go to the details, uh, there are lots of some amendments uh, brought up in the act number 24 of uh, 2017, I suppose, uh, so I suppose uh, has not been fed into Ramis. So that inefficiency is there. What happens when the inefficiency is there, uh, that would create lots of opportunities for further corruption, even in the name of uh, enhancing your tax collection and government revenues. So sometimes we just collect some information. Now, even within the professionals and individuals whose uh, income level is maybe a little above this uh, threshold, so they are going after now tax consultants, tax professionals to uh, find ways of managing their taxes. Like so, they, like everyone in the society now tries to find their own solution on their own, and rather than talking about or bringing uh, this into public discourses. So that that's another area. So my point there is, especially in order uh, for a tax system to be vibrant, it needs to be efficient and should be connected to this uh, technology, then, then only the transparency can be upheld. Otherwise, what happens 
if you collect the data, so even the, the Gajendran highlighted that the professionals and all like they are, that, that is true. I mean, with, by using your own talents and uh, expertise and all those things, but to great extent, so it creates some opportunities for even culprits as well. So when you have um, uh, these uh, inefficiencies, they may not pay taxes. So it is pretty obvious now taxpayers also know that a remit system is not working. Working, And what can they do? Even the estimated amount, they can buy time. They can defer it, okay. Uh, the, 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 it would take more time uh, for the England Revenue Department to come. So for the time being, you can invest your amount which are supposed to be paid as taxes quickly in uh, treasury bills because interest rate is very high. So they, they know the value of money that and this. So these are the practical realities sometimes uh, we may not like to talk about. So this, this, these delays, the deliberate delays also would uh, create lot, uh, lots of problems uh, for tax collection as well. So in tax collection efficiency as well, so I believe that uh, we have adequate uh, human capital and capacity, even technology is integrated. Of course, we can increase it. Even we can reduce the collection cost as of now. Uh, in Sri Lanka, it's around 1%. So when we collect 100 rupees, one rupee goes as the expenses. So compared to the countries in the region, it is roughly in India uh, as reported around 72 cents likewise. So, I mean, from practical point of view, unless and until we address these issues, uh, some or other ways we need to bring about one or other questions and argue from time to time. Then what happens, just take the, uh, uh, the subsequent concessions given. So pretty much evident that why our uh, uh, changes have not been such a, a broader perspective. So immediately some concessions, so like now nowadays we talk about this, the exem uh, exemption of fuel and vehicle allowance and that and this. So sometimes other powerful uh, strata in the society again may uh, negotiate with the government to really get some release. For instance, I'm representing university, I'm a professor in a university. So our salary consists in, uh, uh, consists with different uh, components, the basic salary and lots of allowances academic allowance and research allowance, and like there are some other small uh, allowances. So basic salary is less. Now, the game is on for us, even the government uh, from the government side, it has just proposed for us, okay, we will consider now, so that, that has not, I mean, not, not, not a, in a discussion forum now. Okay, now we'll discuss. So we, we will tax you on the basic uh, salary and we'll uh, discuss um, whether there is any possibility to uh, exclude other allowances, then what happens? Uh, like if we look at from our only professional perspective, sometimes we may like that. Uh, okay, then my I will not be uh, I will not pay that much tax. I'm safe. But as professionals, I, I believe we have to look at from a very broader perspective. Then how about the other people? So they work hard and earn 100,000, 200,000, something like. And so having their kind of life with uh, lots of loans and um, uh, minimum quality of the life, you know, big uh, trouble. But we, we are not worried because our problem is going to be solved. So therefore, uh, these uh, measures uh, really create opportunity opportunities for further corruption. So that the, the opportunity is one of the angle of the triangle of uh, uh, crime corruption and uh, the crime triangle and the corruption triangle. So such opportunities are also created. Um, so I think um, from practical point of view, then what would be the solution? How best we would go on and establish these um, fiscal policies and fair taxation. Of course, it, it is connected to the economy. First, we need to think the ways of developing the economy. Then we can discuss on taxation. Even about the progressive tax rate. So we argue about the percentage rate that, that has gone up to 36. Of course, there are like uh, the questionable areas in the slabs. Threshold is 1.2 million, but the progressive slabs are 500,000, 500,000 likewise. Within a short uh, like uh, brackets of um, income, you would be taxed at uh, 36%. Actually, it's all right to tax higher amounts Prof as long as- Prof Anil, Prof Prof Anil, yeah. uh, be brief so that in the second round- Sure, I'll, I'll finish in one or two minutes and um, um, say what matters in a society in addition to the tax payment it's all right to pay even higher taxes. That is what we need to discuss if your income level goes, I mean, higher and higher, because you need to balance, uh, strike a balance between your leisure 
and social life and professional life. So that um, I think, um, so like this uh, platform, uh, if we can bring about uh, more discourses, uh, not only about taxation and other issues, especially, so how that is connected to economy and uh, propose to the government to have a vibrant fiscal policy, which is independent from the monetary policy. I think this is the right time nowadays, unlike in the past, uh, people were a little bit just um, um, lethargic on these things. Now people are just coming forward and talking about this thing. So we better open such platforms and uh, showcase professional responsibilities and uh, propose good and vibrant, efficient and fair tax system. So that would be fair by everyone in Sri Lanka. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so moving on uh, in terms of initial comments, uh, can I invite uh, Suresh uh, to give a quick synopsis of your take on uh, uh, the recent changes? Yes, I think uh, the recent circular that was uh, issued is uh, very interesting. And uh, as uh, uh, Suleiman pointed out, uh, there is this issue with regard to the discrimination between the public sector employees and the private sector employees. Now, where is this? Uh, how do we address that issue right now? Uh, according to our constitution, uh, Article 14, equality, uh, there's this concept of equality before the law. Has it been breached? Is what we need to analyze here. Whether this circular that has been issued could be contested in the court uh, with regard to it, it's not being uh, constitutional, right? Now, I was reading this uh, recent uh, judgment in relation to the Inland Revenue Amendment Bill, then a few months back when this matter was uh, argued in the courts, uh, in that 52 uh, page uh, judgment, uh, there are certain interesting uh, errors that uh, may be very much relevant uh, in relation to uh, this issue, right? So. I'm reading from the page 18 of this uh, judgment uh, of the determination. <clears throat> it goes on to say, in fiscal legislation, it is a matter for the legislature to decide what consideration relating to uh, hardships or the interest of the economic uh, progress of the people should be given effect to. In taxation matters, the legislature has a greater freedom of classification to determine which category or class of persons who should be granted concessions or not. So the bottom line of uh, that argument there is, in relation to fiscal policy making, normally courts are very much reluctant to get involved. It's left to the uh, parliament to uh, decide. But having said that, that uh, general comment, uh, in the judgment itself, uh, it goes on to show that, uh, quoting an Indian uh, case, uh, again in the judgment it has been pointed out that while it is true that the taxation law cannot claim immunity from equality clause in Article 4 of the Constitution. So the point here is Article 4, 14 of the Constitution, the equality before the law is above the tax law. So tax law cannot be discriminatory, but as a general rule, we can find that courts a bit reluctant to get involved in fiscal uh, policy making because uh, it's, it's, it's for the government to decide, take into consideration all the circumstances that is based on the country. Now, having said that, at what point then the courts will intervene? Now, this is the important point, right? So, uh, why I'm bringing this uh, out is I am personally of the view, uh, in the context of what I'm going to read now, there's enough and more room for this policy to be contested in the uh, uh, Supreme Court in relation to violation of the Constitution. In deciding whether the taxation law is discriminatory or not, it is necessary to bear in mind that the state has a wide discretion in selecting persons or objects it will tax. So that's the general concept. And that a statute is not open to attack on the ground that it taxes persons or objects and not others. It is only when within the range of its selection, the law operates unequally. And that cannot be justified on the basis of any valid classification that it would violate the right to equality. Right now, that is the important sentence. It is only when within the range of its selection, the law operates unequally, and that cannot be justified on the basis of any valid classification that it would violate the right to equality. Now, the question here is, is there a justification 
to discriminate private sector employees as opposed to the public sector employees in uh, formulating this tax policy. So I think there is ample uh, authority here in the recent judgment uh, pronounced by the court also, by the Supreme Court also, that this basis that, that has been selected, public versus private, is not a justifiable uh, classification to impose discriminatory tax policy in relation to the private sector employees. So I, it, it, it's my personal thought, but I think I, so I, uh, I strongly believe that this matter is uh, taken to courts. Uh, there might be a change, there might be a change in relation to uh, this policy. Right, now having said that thing, I have another point to bring out uh, in relation to this uh, point. Now in Suleiman's presentation, he pointed out three uh, specific uh, rules in relation to uh, public sector employees, where the discrimination has been uh, discrimination has been practiced uh, in relation to private sector employees. So what is this? This is basically a traveling allowance could be given to public sector. Only 25% of that will be taken for uh, appeal purposes. A full allowance could be given, but only 25% of that, 25% of the cost uh, incurred by the employer that will be taken for uh, tax purposes. And likewise, uh, in relation to communication facility also, uh, likewise, comment is there. Now, the question here is, what is the scheme of the act? In section five of the Inland Revenue Act, what are profits from employment are given and the rules and the ideal direction, et cetera, et cetera, are there. Now, uh, not only the cash payments, the benefits are also benefits are also uh, part and parcel of the profits from employment. Then section 27, one goes on to provide uh, a rule and it reads, a payment amount to be included or deducted in calculating income of a person shall be quantified in the amount as specified by the Commission General or in any other case according to the market value. Right, so what is the contemplation here now? The contemplation is Commissioner General can step in and pronounce a valuation only when a non-cash benefit is being given, not when cash is being given. So in other words, what I'm telling here is that this circular is ultra virus the powers of the Commissioner General in the context of the rules in the Inland Revenue Act. Equal to before the law is a different issue. This circular, these three clauses that are there in this circular is beyond the powers of the Commissioner General because the Commissioner General has the power to attribute quantify where benefits have been given to uh, an employee. What is the, what is the quantification uh, to be attributed uh, in calculating the uh, taxes in relation to this non-cash benefit? But when you are given a traveling allowance, when you are given a full allowance, the communication allowance, that's a cash payment. Under section 52B, Allowances are included as uh, profits from employment. The Commission General does not have the power to override the parliament and then say that uh, in relation to allowance, only this percentage should be uh, taken for profits from employment. That's beyond his powers. Now, there's another interesting aspect. I mean, we all know basically in Sri Lanka how things happen. And then sometimes the public servants are also helpless uh, when, uh, when uh, things are being uh, pushed on them. Right, so basically this circular that we are referring to, first one was issued on the 22nd of uh, December, SCC slash 2022E05, three days before the Christmas. And thereafter on the 7th of September came the revised circular. Right, so what is the authority, what is the legal framework for this uh, circular that has been issued by the uh, Commissioner General? First one, you can see, go to the last page, Commissioner General has uh, Put here, place the seal, and he has placed the signature. And in the preamble, he says that he, he basically refers that this circular has been issued in terms of section 27, the section that I read out earlier, in terms of section 27, uh, the empowerment that has been given to him. So in it, it goes on to I'm reading that thing. 
in calculating an employee's gains and profits from employment for the second three months period for the year of assessment at 22-23. Non-cash benefits received are derived by such employee from the employment as specified as below by the Commission General of Inland Revenue in terms of section 27 of the Inland Revenue Act number 24 of 217. So at the beginning he's saying that I'm issuing this circular in terms of the power that has been given to me under section 27 to quantify the non-cash benefits. Right, now what do we have in the revised circular? The section under which this new circular, the revision has been carried out, has been taken out completely. So there is no reference to section 27. Now it reads, now this document is also signed by the Commission General at the end of the uh, document, right? This circular is issued on the instruction of the Secretary to the Treasury by letter dated 7th February 2023, under the reference, there's a reference here, as approved by the Minister of Finance, Economic Stabilization and National Policies with respect to quantifying gains and profits from employment of an employee. The circular number, that earlier one, issued in this regard is annulled, and this circular is effective for the referred, for the referred purpose. So you can see uh, there's no reference to, uh, there's no reference to section 27 uh, empowerment. Commission General is telling, I am issuing this circular because I have been directed to issue this circular by the Secretary to the Finance and the Minister of Finance. So I was thinking, okay, he has done the smart thing. He has not uh, uh, said that he has issued this uh, using his powers under Section 27. He is issuing this because he has been told by somebody else to do it. Because if somebody else, somebody happens to go to courts, against the CGIR, Commissioner General, that's the line of defense on it. I not issue, I'm not saying that this is this is a valid according to the scheme of the act. I was asked to issue this, so I issue this. Yeah, so those are my initial comments. Okay. Uh, so Thank you, uh, Suresh. Uh, so moving on, can we, uh, can I suggest Atula, Atula Ranavira, to give your initial comments, Atula? Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, now as we, um, uh, yeah, now when we consider these recent tax amendments, now a lot of people are arguing and there are a lot of issues on these things. Now, the why, first of all, we'll see how it has happened. The government increased a lot of taxes. Now, have they followed the tax principles, the payment ability? I don't think they have followed the payment ability. That is the very reason why the general public, in, mainly including the professionals, are fighting against this. Because the payment ability is disregarded when they introduce these things. Now, ultimately, tax is a temporary collection of money, passing of money from one party to another party, uh, for the benefit, uh, saying for the benefit of the country. Now, more than these tax, actually, the tax system has to be a prop there has to be a proper tax system. At the same time, the tax system to be structured for the development of the country. Is it happening? Now, that is the question. Now. Gen general public are uh, saying that the government is not making use of this tax money for the purpose. Is one issue. The second thing, have they have they structured the tax system for the development of the country? Now, for that, the uh, the most important thing is the increasing of gross domestic production. Now, um, as at now. Our debt uh, ratio to the gross domestic production has gone up to almost 112 percent. Right, our earning is not sufficient to cover up our debts. Now, in a situation like that, okay, tax uh, the tax is needed by the government. That's true, but we have to structure. We have to have a proper tax system aiming towards the government gross domestic uh, de development of the gross domestic production i don't think the government has addressed to that point now as an example now if we'll take 
taxi no the, the uh, putting the export businesses also in par with the other businesses and taxing at the rate of 30% the pra yeah. what has happened practically majority of our exporters now they are in the, the uh, they are creating they are opening uh, branch offices or some other offices in abroad countries like Singapore or mainly Dubai and all and they park part of the profit in those countries ultimately what's happening now we are having a severe financial severe foreign currency deficit in Sri Lanka this is badly affecting to that again that foreign currency deficit is increasing as a result of this now we have to think about these things then uh, the other thing the tax uh, we don't have continuous tax policies now as an example if we'll take agriculture we have a tax exemption up to 31st march 2024 another two years now for an agriculture project for you to get the income it might take three four five years now if they uh, do you think and uh, think uh, an investor who is investing in agriculture sector uh, uh, will be promoted to invest with this short time period policies now especially agriculture sector if they are giving the tax holiday definitely they could be able to uh, expand this uh, extend this tax holiday for uh, at least for another five six years like that they have not done then if I'll come to the things what uh, Suresh also pointed out, I'm also in the view that these circulars, what the Commissioner General has issued, are not in line with the law. As for the law, uh, he is not having authority to issue this type of a circular. And the other thing, he knew that I think that may be the reason why he uh, why he has quoted this uh, uh, secretary of the treasury in this circular because he may be knowing that he he is not having proper authority to issue this circular therefore he is keeping the responsibility loading the responsibility passing the responsibility to another person that is not correct then with related to government employee that 25 percent different treatment of government employee that is also not correct at the same time i have another question based on that now if you see this recent circular item 3b it says the value of any bit shall be 25 percent of the cost incurred by the employer for the payment of any amount of any amount to employee for a payment of any amount to employee for use in a vehicle owned or rented by that employee. That means something like a rent, vehicle rent. Now, out of that vehicle rent, it says 25% to be considered as an employment income. What about the balance 75%? Isn't it a business income? Renting a vehicle and earning a rent income. Now, he is renting a vehicle to the government and earning a rent income, right? Then, out of that rent income, suppose the rent income is 100,000 rupees, 25,000 rupees to be taxed. As per this circular, it is to be taxed under the employment income. What about the balance 75,000 rupees? I think it is covered with the business income because that is, that is another business. Now, as an example, now if you'll take this solar system, the, the fixing of solar systems on your roof. Now, there's a qualifying payment, the, the, there's a the release on that. That's true. But what about the income? That particular income, when you sell the income, the electricity produce, the, the electricity to the CEB, you are getting an income. What is that? That's a taxable income. Uh, under the category of business majority of the people are not thinking that it is taxable likewise now somebody can argue that this 75 percent the balance rental income receiving by the employee is a taxable income under the business category 
that loophole is there. Then uh, in this circular, now the, for the vehicles in the private sector, we will say the private sector for the vehicle, either you can uh, take the benefit. If you are getting a benefit, only you have to pay tax. If you are, if the employee is getting a benefit, only should pay tax. Now, in this case, assuming that you are getting a benefit, they have given some values for the vehicle 20,000, for the driver 10,000, for the fuel 20,000. If you are, if you are, if you are getting a vehicle with driver and with fuel, altogether 50,000 rupees. But there's another, another item, item H. If you are maintaining proper running charts, then you can you can maintain proper running charts and uh, consider value the usage at 25 rupees a kilometer. Now suppose your actual this actual usage is less than uh, less than 2,000 kilometers a uh, month. If your actual usage is less than 2,000 kilometers a month, best thing is for you to maintain proper running charge and apply this 25 rupees per kilometer basis. Suppose you have run only 1,000 kilometers, that is the value is then 25,000 rupees only, not 50,000. Therefore, we have to advise uh, the people who are getting, the employees who are getting this type of vehicles to maintain proper running charts and see whether you can enjoy a lesser taxable uh, non-cash benefit on that. Yeah, that's all for the time being. We will discuss further in the second round. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Atula. Uh, uh, moving to Professor Buddhi, if you can just uh, bring, sorry, uh, Sivan uh, no particular order, but uh, uh, <laughs> after Buddhi, I take your uh, thing. So, uh, Professor Buddhi, yes, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Suleiman. And thank you, Professor Watawala and CMA for inviting me for this very, for this discussion, which the timely thing as everybody has started feeling the pressure. A um, lot of things have been talked about, spoken about the taxation, so I'm not going to repeat on those things or harp on those things. We are totally agree in majority of the things, especially with respect to unreasonable taxation and so on. I speak at this stage as an academic uh, attached to the University of Peradeniya and being a sister union of FUTA, the Federation of University Teachers Association, my university, University of Peradeniya, and we have sister unions over there. I automatically become a member of FUTA and I must also tell you, I fully support whatever the trade union actions taken by FUTA against this most uh, recent uh, tax policies adopted by the government to Sri Lanka. And thank uh, Suleiman for the uh, being the first speaker uh, for eloquently presenting the past and present scenarios and the massive impact on the monthly income earning professionals. That's the most important part that I'm referring to right now. So my short uh, submission at this particular moment, I'll be focusing on academia, but not to say I'm ignoring the impact faced by the other categories. So please do not misunderstand. I will totally focus on academia only at this particular stage because of the limited time that is given to me and available as well. Well, first and foremost, as many one would agree, I'm fully for a reasonable taxation policy. I think all academia understand, do understand the importance of taxation uh, to, to support the, the services rendered by the government or in other words, government operations. I myself being a taxpayer right now throughout, so that's the important point that I have to mention right now. But we should not forget at this particular stage that all of us are unfortunately paying the price for ignoring the corruption and inefficiencies in the system. And that's that's where we unfortunately kept our mouth shut in, uh, I mean, inadvertently allowing things to happen and continue. And we have now started feeling the pressure of being in the receiving end. That's an unfortunate part which I have to mention at this point. But coming back to the present crisis situation, as at present, we do understand the cost and pricing of all products and services available in the market has increased. And the government is not in a position to continue with whatever the subsidies that they have been they have been imposing in the past because we do know the sorry state of the economy that we are in right now. And what we see now is 
to to I'm not trying to say it's a cover up, but trying to find at least a short term solution. Heavy taxation has been imposed, and that especially affects the middle income earning professionals. We are university academia. Uh, will also belong to in most of the cases, especially those that have contributed to the money circulation of this country and support to balance the economy, especially of small and medium scale enterprises in this country. I mean, when 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 every time when uh, say look at the pandemic, what has happened in COVID nineteen pandemic when all the services got interrupted and even the bottom level service provider was increasing his or her prices for the services. It's the middle income earners. And monthly wage earners are the ones who, 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 who was in a not in a position, but was forced to bear the expenses as well for living. So these are some of the things that we should not forget that when we try to impose taxes on taxes on middle income earning professionals, I'm referring to academia specific, specifically at this particular stage. And all those things that happen, remember the cost of services, as Professor uh, Watavala presented at the beginning. Yesterday we had the tariff increases with respect to electricity. All those will further increase the pressure on this monthly income earning middle class. As I told you, majority of academia will fall within this category. Now, why I repeat these things upon these things is because I will finish quickly. As an academic with more than 36 years of service at the university, experience at the university, my main worry right now is the danger that we face with the middle, with the um, the chances or opportunities or high probability that we are going to lose the services of young career professionals in the academia, young, young senior lecturers, young probationary lecturers. It's not only because of taxes, I must tell you, it's not, that's not the only reason, but due to the, the dire economic situation of the country, high and unbearable inflation among media others and shortage of essentials such as medicine and the pressure, of course, due to the income tax policy of the government. A recent survey, the, the Federation of University Teachers Association, before they embark on the trade union action, uh, they, they had a survey done among the university community. And I do understand about 2000 academia has responded to this service, including myself. Uh, then that survey very categorically showed, uh, stated that I, I must thank uh, uh, Dr. Ruchika Fernando of University of Peradenia, the Peradenia University Trade Union. We have, the, we have a syndicate over there. And I must thank Dr. Fernando for giving me this information as well. And uh, um, about, 20, about 48 to 50% of the 2,000 respondents from university academia have clearly indicated their plans either to leave the country in the near future and about 26% out of that have already taken initiative to do so. This is not a good sign at all in, 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 in academic institutions that bring up intellectuals and provide the much needed manpower to the society for economic development. And we also should remember that it takes such a long period of time to take an academy staff member with postgraduate training, spending an enormous amount of money. Sometimes the country spent on them and whatever is done, done, they even go with scholarships and someone has already been spent on them. And what we are trying to earn, what we are trying to receive, is a return to investment from that so that the academia will come back and serve our country, which is a, which is a need of the hour. And if you try to look at this scenario in the present context, if the academia is trying and planning, especially the young people trying to migrate from this country, that's not a good sign at all. And then what we are losing, not only people, but we are losing money as well. That's an important point to be kept in mind. If we do not at least try to remove this unreasonable taxation policy, but go ahead with a reasonable taxation policy. I don't think anyone is going to, going to go against on that. And many academia have returned in the recent past with good intentions. We have to understand the young guys, not a person like me who is, has been in the system for 36 years. They wanted, the young guys wanted to settle in Sri Lanka and serve the nation. And one of the best indication for such a scenario is a trend that we have seen for people to settle in Sri Lanka with uh, investing on the property development, for example, housing construction, obtaining loans and so on from, from, from different banks and and etc. and financial institutions and etc. But such group of academia have been seriously affected now 
because of these very unreasonable policies that have been adopted by the government of Sri Lanka. So it's high time people to think of it once again. Please do keep in mind. I'm referring to academia only in my in my presentation, but I do recognize all the, the, the impact that has been faced by other people, other categories of professionals who are in the country as well. So my 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 plea, the fervent hope right now is that will be more. I mean, more, 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 more visionary oriented, of course, and to make sure this precious young blood, academics, as well as intellectuals, allow them to be in Sri Lanka and create a situation, create an environment, a conducive environment as soon as possible. We know we are in a dire situation with respect to economy, economy but even within that, facilitate and support they are being in the country in the long run. And that will be the biggest investment that we will be making at this type of situation looking in the long run. Thank you very much for the opportunity granted to me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Professor Bhuti. Turning now to uh, uh, Mr. Sivanesan, um, uh, your initial thoughts, Mr. Sivanesan, on the peace and change. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me as a panelist. Uh, I think the most of the things have been uh, discussed now. So I just want to uh, deviate my discussion for a different uh, technical topic. So the, today's, I think the topic is impact on the professionals and the employees. Yeah. So what I am understanding when you come to professionals, I think there are two broader categories. One is the professionals who are employees and the professional who are getting a professional income. So I think the biggest affected party is the professionals who are employees. So I am saying is this because if you look at the, the basis of calculations of the tax, the employees, you can't claim any expenses against the employment income. But if you are professionals, you can claim certain expenses to produce the professional income. I can give a good example. Let's say for chartered accountant who have a who are contributed to the membership. So that the membership contribution, if you are an employee, there's no place for you to deduct that particular expenditure. But of course, if you are engaged in professional practice, yes, you can claim. And especially the, all the professions, and especially for the university academics also, I think, being a professional, we have to spend a lot of money to uplift our professional knowledge. So the employees are in a sort of a discrimination situation where that there's no place for them to claim those expenses. So they have a, I believe that uh, there should be a due recognition should be given to the professional who are employees to, by changing a law to have certain deduction to be allowed against the employment income. Because some of the employees are, even though professionals, there are certain expenses directly related to this professional qualification. So if you upgrade the professional qualification only, you can service uh, in the employment continuously. So that is why my one first thought. The second, uh, I think when you look at the calculation of the uh, individual tax also, I think we have to look at the today's context whether this is in line with the present situation. Because I think what is the presently is the individual who have engaged in a short trading are well off because their property is exempted from tax. If you are a cinema man, you are also much well off because all the cost of producing a film, if cost of starting a cinema are deductible as a qualifying payment relief. But whereas if you are engaged in a export of manufactured goods in individual capacity, you are taxed at a normal step subject to the maximum rate of 36%. Now, what I find is within these two years, when the new act came into the picture in 2018, that was a more compatible. But within these two years, there are a lot of damage that already occurred. Mm. So they have at least now, you have to go back and uh, you have to revise this particular elements. Then there was a uh, thing that whether this regulation issued by the commission agenda, yeah, I also agree with other comments also, this is not lawful. 
So if that's the case, only the solution go to the law, the fair market value should be taxed as employment income. So if that is the case, obviously the when you have a vehicle benefit, no housing benefit. So I think the value will be very significant amount. Mm -hmm. So in that context, I the I think that nobody will contest on that because it's still the regulation is have a much better as Suleiman uh, correctly pointed out. Because though the uh, value uh, specified, the value specified is very much lower than the market value. For example, like even the vehicle benefits and the interest, what are the interest given by is a tax free, but certain countries' interests are taxed, the free loans. And also, one of my recommendations to the employer also for the company is the basically the I think you have to comply with this withholding tax with the APITO AIT. But the reason is, as you know, if you don't comply with this reduction rule, so this will be added as a domestic expenses against your private calculation. So then the corporate are uh, exposed to the tax liability of 30%. Therefore, 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 this should be, I think, properly complied with. And also, my other suggestion is, even the employment, there are certain employees who are directly working in a BPO companies and certain companies where they are directly involving earning of foreign remittances. Let's say, for example, one employee who working in a BPO company, the company getting a foreign currency earnings, the company send, that is 100% tax fee. But if the company is remunerating that one to the main employee who are directly involving earning that income, the employment income is subject to 36% tax. So there is a big anomaly on that. So I think that's have to be that aspect has to be looked into. And finally, that uh, one of the concerns also I have is uh, under the present law, the employees who have exclusively only employment income, which is subject to APIT, is a final tax. So there's no requirement to open the tax file and file the tax return. So there, I think this category is very little now, I believe, because anybody, if you have employment income, you have some amount of the interest income. So then the interest income is subject to 5% withholding. So then the balance payment, you have to pay by opening a tax file. So there were some of the suggestions can be brought in there for a professional as well as certain category of employees where on their request, they can increase the rate of withholding, maybe at a 10% or what the higher rate. Because the uh, you know, withholding compliance is very uh, withholding is I think the, the one of the major revenue to the government. So let's them to contribute on the voluntary basis, some higher rate of withholding and make it a final tax. So what are the interest income and all? So otherwise what happens is even technically, even if you have a small amount of interest, so technically you have to open the file and pay the tax. Though your major part of the employment income is subject to advanced personal income tax. So then that I think uh, I don't have a major other thing, but anyway, I am not going to repeat the same thing like uh, uh, tax burden has gone up. So these things we have discussed already two, three times in the other uh, seminar series. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sivanesan. Uh, for that, so what we will do, we have a few minutes more, I think, for the discussion um, to continue. Um, we'll just take some questions that are coming in the Q&A. Q &A. Um, the first one being whether, and I'll pose this to uh, Atula first, um, whether excratia payments made to staff are taxable by way of distress payments for increase in cost of living. Um, any comments on that, uh, Atula? Now, in that question, it is asking whether it is to be taxable. Oh? Yes, whether it's taxable or not. Yeah, excratia payment is taxable. That is liable to tax. Will be coming because it's a cash payment, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, is the pro the next one? Uh, 
Suresh, if I can direct it to you, is the provision of a vehicle applicable only when vehicle is provided by employer or is it applicable for vehicle allowance or reimbursement by uh, em employer as well? Yeah, so if a vehicle, any allowances given basically on the pi 2 b are basically liable for tax. So if a vehicle allowance is uh, given by cash, uh, that will be uh, taken for tax, employment taxes. So just to add to that, uh, Suresh, if uh, to what extent uh, does it go? So if let's say an employee is renting a vehicle uh, uh, or uh, is paying, and then the, that same bill is maybe reimbursed uh, to the employer, uh, would that still amount to a vehicle provided by the employer, or would it be a cash benefit? If let's say the invoice by the renting companies in the employer's name and the cash is only going through the employee, for example. Yeah, the first question is basically if there's a reimbursement, we need to check and see whether uh, what exactly is the nature of that, right? Now, basically, what we, the fundamental rule here is any expense incurred by the employee where there's a legal obligation for that employer to uh, pay, in other words, it's basically a uh, business expense, uh, official uh, thing, and employee has uh, paid that thing on behalf of the company and is it, and that is getting uh, reimbursed, that is not to be added to the salary. But on the other hand, if it's just a normal uh, vehicle allowance is uh, given uh, in the letter of employment to the person, then it's considered that that's a that's, uh, part of your his uh, office of employment package. How do say? He's deriving it because of his office of employment, not because mm. uh, he has uh, discharged the legal obligation of the employee, and uh, then that is getting a reimbursement, not something like that. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, also basically, if the employee has uh, taken a vehicle to uh, for his use, and the company is uh, paying the rental income direct to the renting company, mm -hmm. on the face of it, basically what will happen is uh, that will go as the profits from employment uh, department will want to tax that. Part. So, if we want to debunk and say that okay, that vehicle. This part of this vehicle I have been using for official purposes, and only this part I have been using for private purposes. Okay, we will have read really dividends, keep uh, book, uh, the records, etc., and try to say that this part is directly linked to the official your official uh, purposes, and therefore only the remainder should be considered for uh, profits from employment as profits from employment. Right. So just to pull uh, Mr. Gajendra into this, so in uh, Mr. Gajendra, are you there? Yes, yes. Yeah, no, on this cash and non-cash, where does this line uh, sort of stand when it comes to vehicles in your view? Um, is, should the company, the company maintained or own vehicle is your company vehicle is given? Uh, should it be that the company owns it? Should the book be in the company's name? Will a finance lease work? Will an operating lease work? Uh, uh, would uh, it be in some third party's name work? Um, what would be uh, some sort of clarification around what the non cash benefit should be? I think, uh, uh, Suleiman, you will agree we shouldn't add to the disruption, distress, and the <laughs> disorder that is going through. Yeah. And whatever we say, uh, you know, the uh, I would uh, advise if uh, 800 or people are or somewhere close to that are listening to this, uh, not to be just guided from what you are saying. You have to sit down and see case by case and see, and see uh, make a proper and considered decision uh, before you embark on something. Now, your question is on uh, uh, the vehicle benefits, right? Vehicle or uh, housing, yeah. What qualifies as uh, non-cash? Where is the line? Is no. it a clear line? Is it a vague basically, line? Basically, <laughs> non-cash comes in uh, uh, for uh, which is not related to employment and that is for your personal deal. You know, so if there is anything per pertaining to your personal use, uh, then there is a, a non-cash benefit arising. Uh, does that answer your question? Basically, the principle that is the what uh, basically that's answered. Uh, am I correct? That's the question, right? Yeah. Yes. So yeah, correct. If in terms of practicality, where do we draw the line? Basically, yeah. No, that is a judgment call, right? 
actually by ICTs and it's a judgment call. You can't have a universal application of a rule in that sense, you know. So you, that's certainly a judgment call and that is different from case by case and employee to employee and employer to employer. So it can vary. Uh, that's uh, when you say judgment, it's, it has to be based on actual fact what is happening, you know. Uh, yeah. which may be difficult to, to establish also. That's what I'm seeing a judgment call. But on this, uh, it, because it's an unkind benefit on vehicles and things like that, the, though there is a discrimination on, as uh, Suresh said, uh, on the government servants, there seems to be a benefit. But I feel when you read this guideline uh, uh, properly, the government servants are unfairly discriminated uh, in those two applications. So there again, uh, I think they have not the guideline has not we have not been come through uh, correctly. Uh, so that is another why, matter. Why do you say that? Why do you say that? That is because they, if you see in the government part one, they are saying that the circular saying official use. You know, if you are using some vehicle for official rule, but what what is the non cash benefit? There is no non cash benefit, but they are assuming a non cash benefit uh, for official use. So uh, that is uh, something and uh, government servants are not excluded from the earlier paragraph. You know, uh, they, they can get caught between more than two paragraphs. There is no exclusion there. The one place they are saying for all employees and uh, other ones are this. So you there are big, there will be so much of inaccuracies and in the, uh, inadequacies in these uh, formulations because these mm -hmm. are all rushly done. And... Uh, yeah. uh, 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 legitimacy of it also can be there and also just if the if the benefits are not specified it it will be unacceptable and if the commissioner general has uh, suresh and that is already done i think he may have uh, covered himself so that uh, if there is any uh, judicial review he is not uh, going to be answerable alone he, he the ministry has advised on the ministry so they are again from one to another it's going I don't know whether the Department of Inland Revenue per se is in agreement with this circular. Uh, you know, that's the reason yeah. from the first paragraph, which says that uh, he has not exercised his uh, statutory powers. Yeah. He's yeah. exercised his uh, the subordinate powers or instructive yeah. powers by coming from another authority. I don't know whether you can consider him a subordinate to the finance ministry, uh, but uh, maybe uh, some uh, finance ministry coming as a policy. Ideally, this statement should have been given by the finance ministry if that is the case. If it is so most likely, they might uh, bring an amendment with retrospective effect in that case. No, otherwise they can't uh, sustain this. No, but I don't think you can go. You can go for. You don't we must not accept hand down the retrospective effect. How can you have a retrospective effect? You can't have a retrospective effect just like that uh, because you are making mistakes. Uh, mm -hmm. I think courts have shut down the retrospective effect of the taxes when the, the judicial review was taken on at least on the fundamental rights were taken up uh, on the uh, on the construction of houses and also for income taxes. That's what they cut off the uh, the dates uh, to October and uh, uh, December for uh, January for the individuals and the companies. And I think the companies also have been a victim of retrospective tax because they have yeah. been the employee, the individuals have been taxed from uh, January, and the companies mm -hmm. are getting taxed at the higher rates from uh, October. Mm -hmm. I think whether it's an oversight or not is another matter of debate. Thank you. So, any other views on this non-cash? If uh, any other, we are going to close in a minute uh, on the non-cash. If there's any guidance for the benefit of because a lot of questions uh, circulating around that uh, we can't take all, but most of it, the principle of determining uh, how you fall into this if anyone wants to comment on it quickly uh, we can take about two comments and close anyway if you are taking this section three of this notice hmm? mm. the first paragraph it says first sentence it says the value of benefit from the provision of a motor or provision of motor vehicle partly used for private use partly used for private use mm. Or the aggregate of the allowance paid in lieu of the provision of such vehicle is quantified as follows. Therefore, this for part A, B, 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 and C relating to the government employees, that means mm -hmm. government employees to be taxed, even government employees to be taxed only if that vehicle is partly used by that employee. 
if it is 100% official use, yeah. um, need not to tax because there's no benefit uh, benefit out of that. No cash, no non-cash benefit. Therefore, if he is using partly for private use, only these, these sections are applicable. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Badul, I, I, on principle, I'll agree. I can, I will agree with you. But if you read paragraph B. You can yeah. say uh, we're providing a vehicle uh, pa fully or partly for official use. Now uh, it is mm -hmm. gonna, you know for uh, in paragraph B and C are using for official use. If it is official mm -hmm. use, mm -hmm. that is is mm -hmm. contradicting the basic yeah. principle of uh, imposing of taxation on non cash benefit. No, mm -hmm. So as can it I, is, I, there is a defect in that. Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I explain my uh, understanding? Yes, of this? So yeah, what it says is basically. Uh, due to a any of the government employees will not be taxed for sure because this has been brought as a relief for the <laughs> government employees <laughs> unless you take a mandamus and ask them to tax because on the on the uh, based on the circular yeah my interpretation of that is B yes, basically uh, whenever there is a circular directive or a regulation issued uh, in that behalf by the government right so this circular also basically uh, on behalf of the government directive is also on behalf of the government regulation is on behalf of the government right so under this re under this uh, circular directive or regulation government has the obligation to provide a vehicle or in lieu of that uh, money to the public servant for his official use now, what is happening is that in, the, in, in a scenario, the vehicle is not being provided, but the, the employee concern is using his own private vehicle or he has rented a vehicle and he's using it. Now, in lieu of that, there is money being given by the government. Mm -hmm. So there are three aspects here. First one mm -hmm. is basically uh, in the circular dire directive or the regulation for official use, the government is obliged to give him a vehicle or cash, basically. Now, that is not happening. Now, what is happening is the, uh, the, the, the employee concern is using his private use. Uh, for his private use, he's using his, sorry, his uh, private vehicle is being used. On account of that, the government is paying a cash payout. So out of that cash payout, 25% of that is only to be taxed. That is that is what it, this says. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Suresh. Uh, so, yes, Professor, with yeah. that, I'll hand it back to you. Uh, if out of time, uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of the panelists uh, for all their vibrant contributions uh, and to CMA uh, for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Sulaiman and also for all the panelists, I think uh, they have gone through in detail. Well, of course, they initially gave their uh, comments and views, and then thereafter, where we went through the questions. I think there were quite a number of questions. Some of those, as uh, Sulaiman mentioned, are uh, maybe all similar things on the cash benefits vehicle that was there. Maybe 57 questions are there. Plus, also, I think, uh, as I said, the uh, interest is very high for the tax uh, webinar and a lot of them were participating to find out that what uh, uh, benefits uh, or what uh, maybe concessions that they could have got, uh, almost 469 or 470 have been participating. So that shows that uh, not only the importance of the tax webinar, but also our panelists uh, and also the presenters uh, who are well regarded uh, in the tax field and the professionals uh, who were there uh, to give their point of view. So once again, let me uh, thank all of you. And also I must thank uh, Mr. Gajendra, the chairman of the Ta Taxation Committee, uh, all our participants, all our other invitees, and all those who participated. And I'm sure uh, that this should have been of great benefit to all. And uh, as we stated earlier, uh, these are all coming uh, one by one. Some of them were maybe taxes or maybe increases, then some reliefs. So I think uh, this would be the game that we have to undergo in the present situation uh, till we are able to maybe uh, uh, initially to get the debt restructuring done and then thereafter to take the uh, path to recovery. So I'm sure uh, I think uh, Professor Buddhi Marbe mentioned about the uh, 
uh, the knowledge uh, knowledge hub you know if the knowledgeable people of the trained people if they leave that they're going to be a major problem so i'm sure that uh, this should be something that the government should take uh, notice and then ensure that uh, they are retained uh, so that we will be able to get the benefit uh, for them to turn out uh, more and more uh, 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 knowledgeable uh, graduates who will be able to make a big contribution to the country. So thanks, thanks very much. Thanks again. I think uh, Mr. Sulaiman, a double job that we have done uh, presenting and also doing the uh, uh, the moderation. So thank you very much and thanks all the presenters. I'm sure you have done an excellent job and also to Mr. Gajendra, all the participants and all our invites. Thank you and all the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.